question two on planes, um, consider three points in ABC with just running back through the country. So. I'll just start from the beginning. Like the whole thing? Yeah, just okay. Oh, okay. Hello everyone, this is a uh, UNSW MATSOC 1131 slash 1141 workshop. Today it will be presented by Angie Wang and Yufan Han. I'm Yufan. I'll be covering the first part of this seminar and then Angie will cover the last bit. So before we start off with the content, we'll be making a quick announcement. Um, for the MATSOC X Data SOC camp, Murder on the Dance Floor. Basically, it's just a dance-themed camp. Um, looking, if you're just looking for people who love maths, I guess, and interested in dancing, pull up. Um, hope you can have a great time here. Um, some information about the camp. Annual admission tickets are on sale, and they'll be open until this Friday midnight for two hundred seventy-five dollars. And if you miss out, final release opens next Monday for two hundred ninety dollars. The camp will be held on the weekend of the first week back for Term 2, 31st of May until 2nd of June, and the tickets are sold on the Facebook event page. So just an overview of what we'll be covering here. Um, for today's seminar, it's mainly just concentrated on the algebra component. We'll just be doing from introduction of vectors to matrices uh, and complex numbers, but I'll just be covering until matrices, and then Angie will cover complex numbers. So. Starting off with the algebra, we have um, planes here. So in R3, um, this is just a quick definition, the parametric vector form of a plane is given by this equation here. So x is equal to a plus lambda 1 v1 plus lambda 2 v2. Um, what this actually means is we have a point that the plane passes through, which is a. There's an infinite amount of points on the plane, so there's an infinite number of a's we can choose. Um, and we also have two vectors that the plane is uh, that, that are parallel to the plane, but these vectors are not parallel to each other because if they were, then we would be able to combine them into a single vector, and that would not be an equation of a plane. Um, the Cartesian equation of a plane is um, this thing seems to have shifted a little bit. Cartesian equation of a plane is given by <coughs> ax1 plus bx2 plus cx3 is equal to d, um, where x1, x2, x3 would just be the coordinates or like the, yeah, I guess the suitable coordinates that would lie on the plane. a, b, c, d are fixed reals. a squared plus b squared plus c squared does not equal to zero, or in other words, a does not equal to b, does not equal to c, does not equal to zero at the same time. Because otherwise you would just have d equals zero, that's not really anything. Um, okay, so moving on to some questions about planes. For like the most basic kind of question we could get, um, you they'll ask they can ask you to find the parametric form given the Cartesian form of a plane. So when you're given the Cartesian form of a plane like this, it gives you an equation in terms of x ones, x twos, and x threes, right? So what we want to do is if we scroll up and look at what our parametric vector form looks like. Parametric vector form looks like some ve uh, some vector a here plus uh, lambda one some scalar of another vector plus lambda two a scalar of another vector. So we know we should have two variables here, right? Um, so what we can do here, we can let x two equal to a variable and x three equal to a variable, because once we've established two variables in our equation, we can write x one in terms of these two variables. So after we write x one in terms of these two variables, we'll end up with what we have here, right? x is equal to negative 7 over 2 minus 3 over 2 lambda 1 minus 5 over 2 lambda 2. x2 equals lambda 1 by definition because that's what we set them out to be. x3 equals lambda 2 as well. And then after that, we have x1, x2, x3 is equal to um, the expression we've derived here. This expression here is what we derived. And then we can split them into the separate components. So all the lambda 1s, we want to group them together. All the lambda 2s, we want to group them together. And if it doesn't include lambda 1 or lambda 2, we also group them together. 
So we know that finally when we get in it into this form at the end, we know that it should pass through negative 7, 0, 0. should be parallel to negative 3 over 2, 1, 0. And should also be parallel to negative 5 over 2, 0, 1. Um, next question, question 2 for planes. Consider three points A, B, C, and R three with position vector with these position vectors respectively, and we want to find a parametric vector form for the plane that passes through the points A, B, and C. So, as we said before, the definition of if we go back to the definition of the parametric vector form, A a point that passes through. We're given three points that passes through. We can choose any of these three. Maybe for simplicity's sake, we can choose the first one. Um, choose four negative nine one. So four negative nine negative nine one and then we want to find two vectors that's parallel to the plane. So when you have when you're given a bunch of points on a plane, what you can do is you know that you can kind of treat these points as like um or well actually to find you can treat these points kind of like vectors. So when you do the two, one of two, or two, if you take two of these points and you subtract them from each other, you'll find a vector going from one of these points to the other point, and that vector lies on the plane, and hence it should be parallel to the plane. So what happens is, for example, if we did like the point, um, what is it again? Eight, three, negative seven. Eight, three, negative seven, we can minus four, negative nine, one, to find one of the vectors parallel to the plane. 4, negative 9, 1. Um, and then we can also do like 8, 3, negative 7, minus negative 6, 5, 2. Negative 6, 5, and 2. For the one up here, this should be equal to 4, 12, negative 8. For the one down here, should be equal to 14, negative 2 and negative nine. And then that's your two vectors parallel. So finally wrapping up the answer, we should have A, the point it passes through, plus lambda one of a vector parallel to it, for uh, 12, negative eight, plus lambda two, um, 14, negative two, and negative nine, like that. Um, if we quickly scroll down to the solutions, um, they did something similar, so we found the same vector here, but they have a different vector here, and that doesn't really, um, it looks like the answer is different, but in reality these planes represent the same thing, because all they really did was they just chose two different other points to find the second direction vector. Um, lines and planes, so yeah, so here's a quick definition for what a line is like. So in Rn, the parametric vector form of a line is x is equal to a plus lambda v. What this means in practice is a, once again, is just a point that um, the line passes through. And lambda v is means some scalar multiple of a direction vector v in the direction of the line. So here's a question about lines and planes. This is about finding the intersection of lines and planes. So we want to figure out where these two things kind of intersect, right? Um, so this is a Cartesian equation for the plane. And if we think about it, like our vector here, x, this is actually just like, it can be represented by x, y, z, right? So if we equate the components, our x component should be equal to negative 1 plus 2 lambda. Our y component should be equal to 2 minus 3 lambda. And our z component should be equal to 3 plus 4 lambda, right? So with these in mind, we have expressions for x, y, and z in terms of lambda. And we have a Cartesian equation relating x, y, and z. So if we can sub our x, y's, and z's into our Cartesian equation, we can obtain a value for lambda. So as we see down here, we get x, y, z in terms of lambda. We make the substitution into the equation down here. So um, this would be x, this is y, this is z. And then we get 2 lambda is equal to 4, lambda is equal to 2 once we simplify the equation. 
And then after that, obviously, we're not done yet, right? We've only found the value of lambda. What we have to do after, we have to sub lambda into the equation of the line to find the point that they intersect. So we sub lambda is equal to 2 in, um, x is equal to negative 1, 2, 3, plus 2 times 2, negative 3, 4, get it equal to 3, negative 4, 11. And then finally, just a quick slide note, when it asks for point of intersection, you should leave your answer like this because you don't want to leave it like a vector, right? Because you're finding the point of intersection, you're not finding a vector. You want to leave it like the one down here. Okay, dot product. Dot product of two vectors, a, b, in r, n, is defined by a dot b is equal to a1 b1, a1 dot b1 plus a2 dot b2, blah, blah, blah. What this actually means is um, if you want to write it out, um, it would be look like a1, a2, dot, 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 a n dot b1 b2 dot 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 b n this is equal to a1 dot b1 plus a2 dot b2 plus a n dot b n like that that's just what it looks like if you write it out as two vectors um, applications of the dot product so we have a question here that requires application of dot product um, it tells us we have a parallelogram formed with side length of 1 and 3 units. If we take the length of both diagonals of the parallelogram and then square each length, the difference between these squares is 6. And we want to find the acute angle between non-parallel sides. Um, so with these questions, I think um, it's recommended if we draw a diagram to see like, kind of what's going on. So if I draw it to scale, well, it's probably hard to draw it to scale, but We'll probably look, end up looking something like this. So we can just arbitrarily let this vector be like A, for example. We can let the one below here be B. So with the information given to us in the question, we already know that the magnitude of A is equal to 1. Magnitude of B is equal to 3. And what we want to determine is the angle or acute angle between them. Because the angle could be obtuse, but we just want to find whatever the acute angle is. Um, so to do this, we have to use the information given to us, right? The information given to us is the length of both the diagonals of the parallelogram um, squared. And then when we take the difference of them, the difference should be 6. So let's figure out what the diagonals of this is, right? Um, so this first diagonal here in blue, that should just be equal to a plus b, right? The vector of a plus b and then if we wanted to take the um, one here, like um, that, that one should be uh, a minus b, right? It's a vector going from b to a, a minus b, a plus b. And the difference between the difference of the squares between these is six. So in other words, the magnitude of a plus b squared minus the magnitude of a minus b squared is equal to six. Um, yeah, so we can see the solution here. We're just simplifying what that expression is equal to. Um, a plus b squared minus a minus b squared. We expand everything um, using the property listed here. Oh, louder. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry. Um, so we just expand everything using the property uh, listed here. Um, after we expand everything, we should get expression that's equal to 4a dot b. And then at the start of the question, it told us that 4a dot b was equal to 6. So then we know um, 6 is equal to 4a dot b, right? But a dot b is also equal to magnitude a, magnitude b, cosine theta, right? That's like one of the basic dot product formulas. So then finally, we have magnitude a, magnitude b, cosine theta is equal to 1.5. Uh, magnitude a equals 1, magnitude b is equal to 3, um, 1 dot 3 is equal to 3, cosine theta is equal to 1.5 over 3, or in other words just half, cosine theta, if cosine theta is equal to half and we want to find the acute angle, then obviously theta is just 60 degrees if we solve it, right? So therefore we have the angle to be 60 degrees. And then now we have the cross product. So we did the dot product before, um, that was denoted by a dot, and the cross product denoted by a cross. 
cross product of two vectors um, is defined by this definition. Um, might be a bit hard to memorize, but it's probably in your best interest if you do. It's a bit hard to do exams without knowing this. Another way you can um, actually do this is like, you can treat it as a problem of finding the determinant. Like, um, it's actually the same thing as finding the determinant of E1, E2, E3, um, A1, <coughs> A2, A3, B1, B2, B3. It's the same as finding this deter the determinant of um, this matrix, right? So E1 is a standard basis vector in R3, same for E2 and E3. E1 is 1, 0, 0, E2 is 0, 1, 0, E3 is 0, 0, 1. Um, basically what happens is we know that when we want to find a determinant, um, uh, maybe we'll get into this a bit later, but basically most simply is um, this is just going to be equal to, if we expand along the top, we'll get, get this is equal to E1 times the determinant of A2, A3, B2, B3, plus E2 of A1, A3, B1, B3, plus E3, um, A1, B1, A2, B2, like that, right? Uh, we, we will get into this a bit later when we talk about determinants, but basically this is just um, how you find the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix. Application <coughs> of the cross product. So now we have a question investigating um, an application of cross product. We're asked to consider three points A, B, C in R3 with position vectors 2, negative 2, 3, 0, negative 4, 4, and 3, 5, 0 respectively. Firstly, we want to find the magnitude of CB. So, um, so this is going to be B here. This is C. So we just we know CB is going to be B minus C, right? B minus C, three five zero minus zero negative four four. Um, uh, then we get negative three negative nine four, and then we find the magnitude of that, which is just each of the components squared, and then taking the square root of that, right? I, I find the area of the triangle with vertices A, B, and C. So A, B, and C, um, we given, uh, actually, yeah, so this is where we start applying the cross product thing, right? Um, we, what we want to do here is we want to find A, B, and A, C. So um, let me see if I have space to draw up a triangle here. So um, it's a bit smooth. We have A, B, and C here. Um, basically what happens is if we can find A, B first, and then we can find A, C. Um, so find, the first steps would be find A, B, A, C. Find these two vectors, find what they are. And then there's, a, there's actually a pretty convenient formula telling us what the resulting parallelogram would look like. So if we completed this triangle, we would actually get like a parallel of just do this in red. Um, if we completed it, we would get like a parallelogram like this, right? And it is known that the par the area of this parallelogram should actually be equal to the magnitude of the cross product between A, B, and A, C, which are the um, non-parallel vectors on uh, lying on the sides of this parallelogram, right? So if the area of that parallelogram is the cross product between AB and AC, then it is expected that this triangle that we have here, which is just half of the parallelogram, should just be half of the cross product, right? So we see here, the formula is here. Area of triangle ABC is equal to half of the cross product, right? Then we, after we've determined what AB and AC are, we apply the cross product formula. We get what the cross product is, and then we just find the magnitude of that and divide it by half. So then we should get the answer is equal to root 170 over 2 unit squared. Remember that because it's area. And then part 3, um, hence or otherwise find the shortest distance from point A um, to the line passing through B and C. Yeah. So using the diagram that I drew before, um, we know that another formula for the area of a triangle 
is the perpendicular distance formula, right? So when you're given like the perpendicular, uh, not, yeah, I guess so, the perpendicular height of a triangle, um, so like, let's say this is the perpendicular height, so it's a right angle here, right angle. When we're given the perpendicular height of the triangle, we know that the perpendicular height multiplied by the base divided by 2 also gives us the area of the triangle, right? So what we can do, we can actually um, equate these two equations, right? So we've already found the area of the triangle, but we don't know what the perpendicular height of the triangle is, right? Or in other words, the shortest distance. The shortest distance is always going to be when the line is perpendicular, right? Um, so... Uh, yeah, so here we know that half of D times CB, so notice how CB is the base that we have here, right? And then D is just what we let to be the shortest distance, right? So D times CB divided by 2 should also equal to the area of the triangle. And then we know what CB is from I. And then after that, we just equate everything, get, get it in terms of D. D should be equal to root 170 over root 106. We can simplify it, so it's just root 85 over 53. And then, therefore, that will be the shortest distance from A to the line passing through B and C. And then next up, we have projections. Um, this is just uh, first thing here, definition of projection. Projection of A, this is projection of A onto B, right? So what this thing here means, you can, you can see that the A is on top of the B, right? So you kind of just remember this as A onto B. Oh, it's a bit thick. So A onto B, right? Because A is like on top of the B, so that means projection of A onto B. What this means when we draw it out is, say we have a vector B lying down here, right? And then we have a vector A somewhere, like, uh, I'm just going to draw it like this because it's easier to understand. Vector A up here, right? A and B. What the projection actually is, the projection is just the shadow of A on B. So if you think about it, if A casts like a, ve a shadow onto B, um, we draw like a perpendicular line down, the shadow should be, look like this, right? So the shadow is going to be parallel to B, obviously, right? The shadow that A casts onto B is going to be parallel to B, and it's going to be equal to some like scalar multiple of B, right? And then um, what we know using the formula is that the projection is given to us by a dot b over b dot b times b. This is the formula that will give us whatever this shadow is. And then the length of this projection is a dot b over b. Um, this is actually pretty easy to prove. It's just, if you think about it, we have a dot b over b dot b times the vector b here. Um, but so this should be actually equal to a dot b over magnitude b squared b. Oh, I should add squiggly lines under it because I'm writing it down. Um, but this is also equal to a dot b over magnitude b times by the unit vector, right? b over magnitude b, right? And we know unit vector has a magnitude of 1, so obviously the length of the projection is just the magnitude of a dot b over b, right? And then next up we have distance between two skew lines and we want to and this is a problem of minimizing the distance or finding the shortest distance between two skew lines so we're given that they're skew so that means they don't intersect each other and they're also not parallel to each other that's just the definition of what skew means right and then what we can do here is we can um what we want to do for these questions is we look at the two direction vectors first right so this direction vector and this direction vector and we want to, what we want to find is we want to find the um, cross product, right? Because what the cross product gives us, the cross product gives us a vector that is perpendicular to both of these, right? And why is that significant? Um, that is significant because the perpendicular distance is always the shortest distance, right? So applying the cross product formula, we'll find that our normal vector is going to be equal to negative 15, negative 6, and negative 3, right? So, and this is perpendicular to both of them. And then what we can do here is like, um, obviously this is not accurate because this, I'm drawing this in 2D, but th 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 these lines are skew, so you can, we can kind of view it in like a 2D fashion. Um, so we're gonna have a line here, another line here, and um, say so we have a point P, another point Q there, 
Um, most of the time, PQ is not going to give us the shortest distance. It's very unlikely that it will. We can find what this vector PQ is, and then using the normal vector, the normal vector is, again, perpendicular to both, right? So when we draw the normal vector, it will be like this. And if we continue drawing it, like if we extended it out, like uh, let's just say that it's the normal vector is that small. If we continued and extended it out, we would expect it to be perpendicular to both of them like that, right? And hence that will give us the shortest distance, right? But ignoring that for now, because it doesn't look nice on the diagram, what we can do here is to find the minimum distance, we actually just project this PQ onto this normal vector. And then now the question is, how do we find this P and Q? Well, actually, it doesn't matter. We can just find two arbitrary points, find this vector PQ, and then any two arbitrary points, as long as they're on the opposing line. So P is on one of the line, Q is on the other line. And as long as we find those two points, and we can project them onto this normal vector, we'll be able to find the minimum distance. So P and Q, what are our choices, or what's easy to choose? Obviously, this is easy to choose, because we know by definition this is just a point that lies on the line, and also this, by definition, just a point that lies on the line, right? So we use that as our P and Q, so then we'll have something like, um, yeah, so P, or P here would be the same as what I defined as PQ, it would be um, this point here, negative 5, 8, 7, minus negative 9, negative 7, 2, that will give us our PQ, right? Then it will give us 4, 15, and 5, right? 4, 15, 5, so we know that's what PQ is, right? And then once we project PQ onto the normal vector here, the shadow that it creates is going to be equal to whatever um, this length is, right? And whatever that length is, is ultimately the going to be the shortest distance because as I explained before, that's the perpendicular one, right? So after this, it's just a problem of finding the length of the projection, right? Length of the projection is projection, so when you have a projection of A onto B, the length of the projection is A dot B over magnitude B. Um, you have to take the absolute value of A dot B though, because you don't want a negative length. So, um, what we had for the normal vector was negative 15, negative 6, and then 4, 15, 5. Just take these two here, and then dot product, and then divided by the magnitude of the normal vector. So finally, um, after we do all the calculations, it should just um, evaluate to 55 over root 30, and then that'll be the shortest distance. Matrices, systems of equations and determinants. Um, so now we're on to the matrices part. Um, the first question, evaluate P, the product of P, Q to the power of T. Q to the power of T just means um, you take the transpose of Q. So what the transpose means is that you just essentially you switch the rows and columns around, right? So we see Q here. We look at the first row, 1, negative 1, 1. That becomes the first column. So if you write it out, that will become 1, negative 1, 1. And then second row, 2, 5, 0. The second row becomes the second column. So 2, 5, and 0, like that, right? So this is equal to Q t is for transpose and then after that we just evaluate it as we do normally right so how do we evaluate um, multiplication of matrix um, we get here so when you want to evaluate the uh, multiplication of a matrix what we can do is you can consider it as a problem of evaluating the dot product between columns and um, rows right so we can look at the first row of P, which is 1, 2, 1, right? 1, 2, 1. Um, actually it's not. 1, 2, 1. And then we can write it down, right? 1, 2, 1. Dot. We, can, we should dot that to the first column of the um, vector on the right-hand side. So the first column of the vector on the right-hand side is 1, negative 1, 1, right? So whatever this is, 1, negative 1, 1. Once we take the dot product, this is equal to... 1 minus 2 plus 1, this is equal to 0, right? So we know 0 should be our first entry, right? 0 is our first entry. And then what we do after this, we just repeat the process a few more times until we finish everything, right? So then the next step would be to take the... Um, we're still... So 
this is an entry in the first row, right? Because we're still um, dealing with the first row of the uh, right hand side, of the left hand side, sorry. When we're dealing with the um, first row of the right hand side, all the entries stay in the same row, right? And then when we want to use the second column of the uh, of Q transpose, so two five zero, we're gonna do the same thing as before. Do take the dot product, so two times one plus five times two plus one times zero. That's equal to twelve, so zero twelve. And then after that, we can move on to the second row to find our entries for the second row, right? For, to find our entries for the second row, the first entry for the second row is 1 times 3, negative 1 times 1, 1 times 4. And then we create the same thing as before, but then we just finish and get the entries as 8 and 1. Um, Oh, also, before I move on, I'll just quickly explain um, <coughs> if there's some like actually, I'll explain it when we get to question two. So, what is the size of P transpose multiplied by Q? P transpose, as um, we said before, this should be easy to find. This is 1, 2, 1, 3, negative 1, 4, right? When we're talking about the size of a matrix, um, what we want to do is we want to say it's a certain number of rows times a certain number of columns in that order, specific order, right? Always rows before columns. We have three rows and we have two columns, right? So that's a three times two matrix, right? And what is Q? Q is a, um, has two rows and three columns, right? So that's a two by three, right? Two by three in size. When we have these two matrix multiplied together, so we're gonna multiply these two matrix um, of these sizes. What we want to actually, the resulting size would just be the amount of rows of the matrix on the left hand side and the amount of columns of the matrix on the right hand side. More simply, if we wanted to generalize this case, we would say in our um, N times P matrix, N times P matrix, if we want to multiply that to a P times Q matrix, P times Q matrix, the resulting matrix would have a size of N times Q. So once again, the, the number of rows from the left-hand side matrix and the number of columns from the right-hand side matrix. And then just another thing to be, um, just another thing to note is um, another condition for- I think it's the opposite. I think it's P times Q. I think it's the end. Sorry? The size of the matrix is the inner. And it should be the outer. It's the outer. Um, anyways, continuing on. Um, the condition for matrix multiplication to actually exist is if these two inner ones are actually equal to each other. So that's why I wrote P and P again, right? Otherwise, I would have used a different variable. So this P here needs to be equal to this here, right? If these two aren't equal, then that means the matrix product does not exist, right? So we'll see this for question three. Question three asks, does the matrix product PQ exist? And we need to explain our answer, right? The matrix product PQ is a three times two, oh, actually, it's a three times two matrix multiplied by a three times two matrix, right? And obviously these two entries don't equal to each other. So the amount of um, columns from the one on the left hand side does not equal to the amount of rows from the matrix on the right hand side. So hence the product does not exist, right? So if we um, take a look at the, what the solutions say, PQ does not exist since we are multiplying a two by three matrix by a two by three matrix. Last number, the first bracket needed to have matched the first number and the last bracket, wait. Um, matrices, systems of equations, and determinants. Um, solubility from row echelon form. So after transforming augmented matrix for system, yeah, so we, this is just a um, thing about solutions of mat matrices, right? So matrices can only have zero, one, or infinite solutions. There's nothing in between. Um, so the first case, if we look into it, system has no solution if and only if Right hand column is the leading column, right? Right hand column would be this entry here, Y. If somehow this is your leading column, then that means we have no solutions there. Um, system has a unique solution if 
if and only if every column on the left is a leading column. This just means that like for every column here on for our U, they need to be a leading column. If for whatever reason one of these columns or one or more of these columns are not leading columns, then we'll go to case three, which would be it would have infinite solutions, right? So if it's not the first two, then it has infinite solutions. Um, and then here's a question about matrix. For some values of real parameters, A, B, C, D, the curve AX squared plus BY squared plus CX plus DY is equal to one, passes through the points A, one, one, B, two, three, C, zero, one. Explain why the following equation can be used to determine the values of A, B, C, D for which the curve passes through the points. So we're given the curve passes through these three points, right? So what we want to do is um, for these points, um, so A11 means that when x is equal to 1, y is equal to 1. So when x equals 1, y equals 1, that must be satisfied, right? So when we make the substitutions into the equation, we get A plus B plus C plus D is equal to 1. So it must satisfy that condition. We sub x equals 2, y equals 3 must also satisfy that, uh, that condition. And that's given by our second equation listed there. And then 0, 1, when x equals 0, y equals 1, that means b plus d is equal to 1. And that's our third equation listed down there, right? So if all three of these conditions are satisfied, that means the curve does pass through a, b, and c. And hence, if we can solve this system of equations, then we can determine the curve that passes through these points, right? Um, Part two, use Gaussian elimination to solve the system of linear equations in part one. Yeah, so I guess the first part for this would just to be writing it down as a matrix, right? Um, if you write it down as a matrix, it will be 1, 1, 1, 1, 4, 9, 2, 3, and then 0, 1, 0, 1, and then 1, 1, 1, right? Like that. So with the right-hand side column being the... Um, the whatever we had here, right? One, 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 one. Just a solution to the equation. Um, and then we want to use Gaussian elimination to solve the system of linear equations, right? Gaussian elimination. We uh, uh, perform this by doing row operations, right? We can do multiples of rows minus subtract the other rows, right? So our leading entry in the first row is already a one, right? So that's um, pretty nice, but if for whatever reason, if for your first row, your leading entry is not a one, you either replace it with another row that does have a one there, or you can divide everything by a row but by a certain scalar component. For example, if it started with a four, you'll just divide every component in that row by four, so you'll get a leading entry with one, because it's just easier to work with ones, right? So in this case, um, we already have a one here. Um, we wanna so when we want a leading entry, that just means that we want to make everything below that leading entry equal to zero, right? So we look at um, row two here, it starts out with a four, right? But we're thinking, if we can do row two minus four times a multiple of row one, that means we can make the first entry of our row two to be equal to zero, right? And that's what we want. So if we can scroll down, we look at what the solutions do. Um, row two is equal to row two minus four R1. What this operation essentially means is that um, our, our new row 2 is equal to our old row 2 minus uh, 4 times row 1, right? So 4 times row 1 would give us 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, and then we do row 2 minus that, 4 minus 4, 9 minus 4, 2 minus 4, 3 minus 4, 1 minus 4, and then so on, so on. Um, and then after that, um, see here, they interchanged row, this operation here, um, row 2, switch with row 3 with, with the arrows pointing at each other that just means we're switching around row 2 and row 3 right because as I said before it's easier to work with when the leading entry is a 1 right so see how the leading entry was originally a 5 here right we want to switch it so we made it into a 1 right made it into 1 and then now we just do the same thing as we did before we want to make all the entries below that to be equal to 0 right if we do that we have to do the third row minus 5 of the second row and after we do that, we'll get the entry to be equal to zero, right? Excuse me. Yeah. I just want to say something. Uh, when we had the left plus two practice, uh, so at the step R2 switched by R3. Yeah. So I remember trying to do that. Um, I said it was wrong. It was actually, I should have made the row zero, the column equal to zero, and then divide by 
Five. Uh, sorry, will you make what equal to zero? So they they wanted to so they prioritize making the column as equal to zero and then having the leading you know in the yeah. They prioritize what making what zero? The second column. The second column? Yeah. Making what zero in the second column? Uh, everything below the leading. They, they just switched these steps, last two steps. I just wanted to ask, is there a oh. variation generally? Um, I think it doesn't really matter, but like, um, imagine you had like a lot more like rows below that, right? Like you have one, 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 zero, five, negative two, one, zero, one, zero, one. Let's say you had another one below that, like zero, two, three, four, zero, six, seven, eight, something like that. Then it's a lot easier if you had a one as your second row, right? Because every following other row you can do like for example if it, if it was a six in the second entry of the third row or something then you can just do six minus um, six times the second row right if you had a four there it would just do four my uh, that row minus four of the row with the one in it right does that make sense so yeah. always prioritize the leading you mean making the leading as equal to one yeah generally speaking that will make your life easier but like the, the other ways do work. It's just generally, that's just like the, what do you call it, procedure that you follow. Um, what are we up to? Yeah, okay. So now we want to solve the system of linear equations, right? So first part, use Gaussian elimination and then solve the system of linear equations, right? So after we've gotten it into this form, we want to start writing a bunch of equations out, right? So what the equations we get here, we get negative 2c minus 6d is equal to negative 8. Um, b plus d is equal to 1. And then a plus b plus c plus d equals 1. a e plus c plus d is equal to 1, right? And then if we want to find a general solution for this, we can't just leave it looking like this, right? What we can do here, actually, we can say like, we can let d equal to k, for example, right? If we try to, try to solve this straight away, we know that this wouldn't have a unique solution because not all columns are leading, right? Like if I tried circling all the leading terms, we'll have one here, one here, one here, but nothing to circle in the uh, fourth column, right? So that means this should have infinitely many solutions. Um, if we let d equal to k, for example, d is equal to k, if we let d equals k, and we try to write everything in terms of k, so we can find like a general solution for these variables, right? Um, we can get negative 2c minus 6k is equal to negative 8, or in other words, um, 8 minus 6k is equal to 2c, so c is equal to 3 minus, oh, sorry, not 3 minus, 4 minus 3k, um, b plus d is equal to 1, d is, uh, b is equal to 1 minus d, so b is equal to 1 minus k, right? b equals 1 minus k, and then a plus b, which is 1 minus k, plus c, which is 4 minus 3k, plus d, which is k, is equal to 1, right? So then a plus 1 plus 4 is 5, um, 5 minus k minus 3k plus k, which would be minus k minus, um, which would be minus 3k, yeah, minus 3k is equal to 1. So finally, a should be equal to 3k minus 4, right? So then once you write this out as like a, um, if you write out the solution like this, a, b, c, d, what is this equal to? This is equal to 3k minus 4. 4, um, B is 1 minus K, C is 4 minus 3K, and then D is just K, right? And then what we can do here after, we can separate the variables, right? Separate, so it'll be 4, 1, 4, 0. Well, actually, we don't even need to separate the variables, but I'll just explain it in a bit. Plus K, 3, negative 1, negative 3, 1, right? And what this is, this is the equation of a line, right? Equation of a line, so we know this is 
obviously infinitely many solutions, but we've already established that it's infinitely many solutions because not all the leading we did we did not have all the columns to be leading columns, right? Um, we can also just establish it from right here, right? Like whenever you have like your solution in terms of a variable or one or more variables, you immediately know that there's going to be infinitely many solutions, right? Because you can sub that variable equals one, two, three, four, five, whatever you want, and there's going to be an infinite amount of things you can sub in for that, right? So, um, yeah, so that's pretty much um, what part three was asking. It's asking zero, one, or infinitely many curves of that form, right? So we know it's going to be infinitely many. Um, part four, using your answer from part two, find the parabola of the form y is equal to alpha x squared plus beta x plus gamma, which passes through a, b, and c, right? So when we're looking at this um, equation, um, it tells us it's a parabola, right? And that actually helps us a lot, right? So if we see here, the coefficient of our y is one, right? So d should be equal to one from, well, from the equation here, right? So if we want d is equal to one, so if d is equal to 1, let's see what happens. So re remember that we said d was equal to k, right? If d is equal to 1, then logically speaking, k is equal to 1, right? k is equal to 1. I'll actually write it down here. Um, k is equal to 1. k equals 1. Um, if k is equal to 1, we look at the general solution we found here, right? We can look at the general solution that we found here, and we can just sub k is equal to 1 there, right? After subbing k is equal to 1 in here, we get a, b, c, d is equal to, so we get a equals negative 1, a equals negative 1, b equals 0, c equals, um, c equals to 1, d equals 1, right? c equals 1, d equals 1. Um, and then when we want to rewrite it in the parabolic form, y is equal to alpha x squared. Well, let's just start with the form that we were really given, right? ax squared plus by squared plus cx plus dy equals zero. Um, so a equals negative one, so that means we have negative x squared first. Negative x squared uh, plus by squared. B was equal to zero, so we don't have a y squared term. C is equal to one, so plus x, and then um, plus y is equal to one, right? Because d was equal to one. So then finally, we should have y is equal to x squared minus x plus one, right? Be our final equation. Um, if we look at the solutions here, it's done in a slightly different method. So they found um, they just left it in the equations they had from before. Um, negative 2c minus 6d is equal to negative 8, b plus d equals 1, a plus b plus c plus d is equal to 1, that's the three equations we had. Um, and what they did was they used back substitution, right? So well, either way, we still have to establish that d is equal to 1, right? So you see here, d is equal to 1, because the coefficient of y was equal to 1, right? So if d is equal to 1, um, we solve that in, we can find c. Um, we sub that into the second equation, we can find b, and then now we have the values for b, c, and d, so we can find the value of a. And then hence, we get the same result as well, right? Um, and then moving on, these are some properties of determinants. Suppose that a, b are two n by n matrices, then determinant a, b is equal to the determinant of a times by the determinant of b. So this is just a property. Um, the second one is A is an invertible matrix if and only if the determinant of A does not equal to zero. Or in other words, if our <coughs> determinant of A is, is equal to zero, then what that means is we can't find an inverse for it. If a row or column of A is multiplied by a scalar, so this is like another row or column operation, when we do this and we multiply by a scalar, then the value of our determinant is multiplied by the same scalar. So for example, like if I had a matrix one 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 and I decided to make this two two one one we essentially multiplied the first row by two right that means the determinant of this the determinant of this determinant of two two one one should be equal to two times the determinant of one 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 like that right 
that's just what the main thing practice. Um, matrix, yeah. So this is just listed out in words. Um, this is an example here of calculating a determinant. Um, so a squared minus 4a. Do we really want to compute this directly? Probably not, right? A squared is probably not that great to find unless you have like Maple or MATLAB or something to calculate it for you. Um, if you want to do this by hand, what we can do is actually determinant of B. So determinant, actually, I can't write it down here. Determinant of B is equal to determinant of A squared minus 4A, which is equal to the determinant of um, A multiplied by A minus 4I. Um, the thing is, um, when we factor out like um, a matrix out of like a term such as like 4A, um, we always have to leave an I there, right? Because if we can't just leave like a one there, it has to be like identity matrix, right? Um, and then this should be equal to determinant of A times by the determinant of a minus 4i, like that, right? So then now it's just a question of finding the determinant of A and A minus 4i, right? So the identity matrix is just a matrix that looks like, um, that has a bunch of ones in its diagonals and it only has ones in its diagonals. Everything else is equal to zero. So after a little bit of computing, um, we'll find that A minus 4i is just pretty much every diagonal minus four. So First, I, first entry on the diag on the first row, negative one minus four, negative five, one minus four, negative three, one plus k minus four, k minus three, and so on and so forth. Just keep minusing four to all of those, and then you'll find a minus four i. Um, and then the next problem is, after we found a minus four i, we still need to find the determinant of a and a minus four i, right? So from, um, so there's this property of determinants where it's like when you have something reduced in row echelon form or when you have like um, a bunch of zeros, like yeah, like upper triangular matrix would be the term, I guess. We just see like a bunch of zeros down here. Well, usually it would be reduced at row echelon form when you get this type of like question. Um, so you'll see a bunch of zeros down here, 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 and here, right? So what this means is in this case, if we want to find the determinant, we can just multiply everything across the diagonal and that will give us the determinant of the matrix, right? So for example here, the determinant of A would just be everything in the diagonal multiplied by each other, right? So negative one times one, times one plus K, times three, times negative one, right? And then that would end up giving us three times K plus one. And then we do the same thing, repeat the same process for A minus four I. Um, we repeat the same process for a minus 4i, we get, we'll get 75 times k minus 3. So finally, the determinant of b should be equal to 225 k plus 1 k minus 3, right? That's the determinant. Two, hence find all values of k such that b is not an invertible matrix. So remember what we said before, if a matrix is not invertible, that means the determinant is equal to 0, right? So we just want to find the values of k such that it makes the determinant equal to 0. So the um, k's that make the determinant equal to zero are pretty obvious. We just have to solve this thing here. Um, k plus one equals zero or k minus three equals zero, right? So k is equal to negative one or k is equal to three, right? Um, that one's not that bad. Consider two by two complex matrix given as A is equal to two I one plus I and alpha. And the first part is finding the inverse, right? So in a more general case, if we try to find the inverse of A, B, C, D, right? If we try to find the inverse of this matrix, this would be equal to, let's say our A is equal to this matrix, right? The inverse of this is equal to 1 over the determinant of A times the matrix, but um, the thing to look out for here is you take the two opposing terms, or like on the diagonal, so A, D here, you have to swap these two around. So it will be D and A like that, right? And then the other two terms, C and B, these two, we have to chuck negative signs in front of them. So negative B minus C like that, right? And then that will be our inverse for a two by two matrix, right? That is how we find the inverse. Um, determinant of A, um, should uh, explain this before, I think. It would just be AD minus um, BC, right? So again, the diagonals, um, the first, 
diagonal in blue, we multiply them together, minus the diagonal, second diagonal, multiply together. So AD minus uh, BC. So determinant of A would be equal to AD minus BC. Right? So then if we want to calculate the inverse, in this case, we just apply everything that we have here, right? So I guess the first step maybe you want to do is try to find the determinant. Um, you can do either step first, but I guess finding the determinant is better first. So the determinant of um, A in this case should be equal to the diagonal 2 alpha minus the other diagonal multiplied by each other, right? So 2 alpha minus I times 1 plus I, this should be equal to 2 alpha minus I plus 1, right? That's our determinant, and then that means our inverse, therefore, inverse should be equal to 1 over 2 alpha uh, minus I plus 1 times by swap the um, diagonals around, alpha 2, like that, right? And the other two diagonals, chuck negative signs in front of them, right? Negative I here, negative 1 minus I, right? So now that should be our inverse, right? Um, if we look down here, yeah, that's exactly the answer we have down there, right? The next part, we have to find all values of alpha for which the determinant of a squared is equal to negative 1, right? So using the determinant properties we learned from before, determinant a squared, this should be equal to the determinant of a times a, right? Which is actually just determinant of a times the determinant of a. So determinant of a squared is equal to negative 1. So that means determinant of a is actually just equal to plus minus um, plus minus i, right? Determinant of a is equal to plus minus i, and then now we want to find all values of alpha that satisfy this, right? So determinant was equal to 2 alpha minus i plus 1, right? So either the case is that it's equal to i, or 2 alpha minus i plus 1 is equal to negative i, right? So from this case here, we'll have um, alpha is equal to 2i minus 1 over 2, and then from this case here, we should have alpha is equal to negative half when we just finish solving the equation, right? Um, if we look here, it's the answers we have here, right? Alpha is equal to negative half, alpha is equal to 2i minus 1 over 2. Um, next question, we're just trying to simplify a matrix expression, right? ATA, um, inverse of that, multiplied by ATA, transpose of that, right? So in this question, what we want to do is we want to use um, some inverse and transpose laws, right? So the inverse law for products is basically the reverse product, right? So um, AT, sorry, ATA inverse is actually should be equal to, you flip these two entries around, right? So you become A inverse multiplied by AT inverse, like that, right? Same thing happens for transpose, right? ATA, we take the transpose of this, should be equal to A transpose times by A transpose transpose, right? But when you transpose a transpose, it's just equal to itself, right? Which is equal to A transpose A. And then finally, putting everything together, this expression should be, should, um, actually, yeah, I'll write it down here. This expression should evaluate to just A inverse of AT inverse, AT A, right? And then notice how what we have here in the middle, AT inverse AT, um, we know from the inverse properties when a matrix is multiplied by itself or by the inverse, it will just be equal to the identify, uh, identity matrix, right? So this would be A inverse I A now, right? Like that. But the I doesn't really do anything, right? Because any matrix multiplied by I is still just itself, right? So this is equal to a inverse A, which is just equal to the identity matrix again, right? Um, we look at the solution, just applies the same method as we did, right? Um, now we have a bunch of question determinant questions and then some volume questions for vectors. So question one here, um, A equals to A, B, C, D. B equals ABFG for some ABCDFG belonging to real, and we want to find the 
addition of these determinants, right? So the determinant of A is AD minus BC, so we should have AD minus BC plus um, AG minus BF, right? AG minus BF, like that. Um, and once we have it, which we can pretty much, uh, actually probably better we factorize it now. So A um, D times D plus G minus B times C plus F, right? So this is what we get for the determinant of A plus the determinant of B. Next, we want to find an N such that the determinant of A plus the determinant of B is equal to N times the determinant of A plus B, right? Um, what is A plus B? A plus B, um, addition of matrix, right? Addition of matrix only defined for matrix of the same size, right? 2 by 2 plus 2 by 2, A plus B. What we do is, for entries in the same row and column, we add them together, right? So first row, first column, add them together. Um, first row, second column, add them together. Second row, first column, second row, second column, add them together, right? So the resulting matrix of A plus B should be equal to... So... A plus B, this should be equal to 2A, 2B, C plus F, and D plus G, right? C plus F, and D plus G, right? So then, if we want to find the um, determinant of this, we just do the same thing as we did before. Determinant of this should be equal to 2A times D plus G minus 2B times C plus F, right? Which is clearly double of what we had here, right? This thing times 2 would get us that to what we have here, right? So if we want to find an N such that it's equal to what we had before, um, it's been doubled, so we just halve it again, right? So N should be equal to half. So yeah, N equals half for question 2. Um, question three, you want to find a volume of a rectangular prism defined by these vectors. Um, let's see how much space I have. Okay, I'll draw this one on the side. So question three, you want to find the volume of this rectangular prism, right? Um, maybe it's hard to visualize, but essentially it's just a rectangular prism with these um, dimensions, right? So it has a di one of the sides is has length one, width four, and then height to something like that, right? Um, if you want to see what it looks like, you can also attempt to draw it out, but we'll see how it goes. Um, draw a bit further down. Oh, oops. So this is kind of like a 3D space. Our vector was 1, 0, 0. So let's say this is like 1. Oh, I'll draw it a bit Pick a bit bigger. Like 1. That's on the x-axis. That'll be the point. 1, 0, 0. Um, 0, negative 4, 0. So on the y-axis. So we go in the opposite direction. So maybe like somewhere over there. That'll be um, 0, negative 4, 0. And then um, the other the last one is zero zero two zero zero two is going to be like somewhere up here on the z axis, right? Zero zero two, right? And then we want to see what the volume of this rectangular um, prism is, right? Um, so if we draw it out, if we try to finish drawing it out, it should look something like this, 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 that. Mm. Like that, right? That's what the finished rectangular prism should look like. And obviously, what we do to find the volume of this, we just multiply all the dimensions together, right? So obviously, negative four. We don't multiply by negative four, right? We just multiply by four. So it just be two times four times one, which is equal to eight units cubed, right? That should be the volume of this rectangular prism. And then question four. Um, this one's a bit different. You want to find the volume of a parallel pipe bed, right? Defined by these three vectors. Um, so, 
we kind of want to figure out like some type of uh, what do you call it a uh, formula for the volume right so maybe like an intuitive one would be something like this so if I quickly draw what this looks like for question four um, you have a parallelogram this um, Yeah, so I guess it looks something like that, right? This is what the shape would look like. It's like a parallelogram, but kind of in 3D. Um, you have these three vectors that it's defined by. So um, let's say it's A, B, and C for now. Doesn't really matter what it is. Um, A, B, and C, right? So if we take the perpendicular height of C here, so this height, the perpendicular height of C, um, it has, let's say it has an angle of like theta, right? The perpendicular height of C would be magnitude of C times cosine theta, right? Because if we just complete the triangle and we use cosine rule, we, we can find that the perpendicular height of the parallel pipe this should just be magnitude C times cosine theta, right? And then now with this in mind, um, if we can take the perpendicular height of this <coughs> shape and we multiply it by the base, that should give us the volume, right? And then for the base, there's a handy um, formula that we had from before, right? So the formula we had from before was when you take the cross product of two um, vectors on a parallelogram, that not two non-parallel vectors on a parallelogram that lie on the sides of the parallelogram, that would give us the area for the base of the parallelogram, right? So the cross product of that, so the cross product of a times b, whatever this is, this gives us the um, uh, base of the parallelogram, right? And then what we want to do to find the volume is we multiply these two quantities together, right? So magnitude of A times B times C times cosine theta. Um, it should add, I guess, extra absolute value around this because it's the volume, right? Once again, we want it to be a positive value. And then what we notice here is this is actually just equivalent to the dot product between the, our vector C and the cross product A, A times B, right? Or A cross B, whatever. Um, so this should be equal to C dot cross product of A times B, right? So now, um, going back to the question we have here, now we just want to find the cross product and then we just take the dot product of our last vector to the cross product of the other two vectors we use, right? So for example, like, if I wanted to take the cross product of these two, um, we could apply the, like, determinant formula. Um, kind of running out of space here. Um, I'll delete the diagram here for now. Um, so, using the determinant method, E1, E2, E3, and then we write down our other two vectors. So, if I wanted to do um, this vector, cross product this vector, you'll write the vector on the left hand side on top, okay? So, I'll write 1, 0, 0 on top, 1, 0, 0, and then 0, negative 4, 0. 0, negative 4, 0. We try to find this determinant. Um, the first entry is going to be equal to zero. Um, second entry should also equal to zero, and the last entry should be equal to negative four. So finally, if you do the cross product, the applied cross product, you should get the um, 
cross product to be negative zero zero negative four. If you're concerned about if this answer is correct or not, you can always um, dot product it to your other two vectors again, just to check if it's uh, do the dot product again, just to check if it's equal to zero. If it's, it is equal to zero, then your answer is most likely correct. Um, so we have the cross product now. Now what we want to do is we want to take the last vector here, negative one, one, two, and then we want to dot it to the cross product, right? To give us finally the volume, right? Using the formula that we wrote down here. So then, um, last part is just trying to find the um, delete some stuff again. Last part is just trying to find the dot product. Oh. What is happening? Zero, zero, negative four dot. What's the vector? Negative one, one, two, right? Negative one, one, two. We want to find the magnitude of that. Um, it's just going to be equal to magnitude of negative eight. So it's equal to eight units cubed again, right? So this is the final answer. Eight units cubed for the volume of the parallel pipe, right? Um, and then I think this is the last question here for the matrix and vector section. Um, another determinant question. Suppose that A, B, C, D has a determinant of 4 and you want to find the determinant of this matrix. So as we said before, when you um, do operations with like a matrix, it changes the, when you multiply them by a certain scalar across the rows and columns, is going to change the determinant, right? So for example, if the determinant of A, B, C, D is 4, then we immediately know that determinant of 2A, um, 2B, oh, 2A, 2B, C, D, this should be equal to A, right? And then after that, um, if we multiply the second column, if we multiply all those entries by 100, we know that it's going to make the determinant multiply by 100 as well, right? So that means, oh, actually I should write determinant in front of this. So then the determinant of 2a and then multiply every entry on the second column by 100, 200b, c, 100d, determinant of this should be equal to 8 times 100, which is just 800, right? So if we look at the solution, um, yeah, same thing kind of occurs. Here. Oh, actually, solution here did it a bit differently. They just um, did it the, I guess, normal way you would figure out the determinant, right? So the determinant, you take the product of the um, entries on the diagonals, right? So A times D and then B times C, right? So here, 2A times 100D, C times 200B, right? You take these two and you find the difference, which would give you 200 of AD minus BC, which we know to be equal to 4. So that's why we have uh, 800 here as well, right? And then I guess that wraps it up for the uh, matrix and vector sections. Do we have any questions regarding this section or are we free to move on? And no questions? Okay, I guess then Angie will continue with the next section, which starts with the Moivre's theorem. for that wonderful explanation of all things um, vectors and matrices. I'm going to go through um, complex numbers. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Angie, and I'm just going to go through a couple problems that are of interest. So we're going to start with Dumas' theorem, um, which I guess is familiar to some of you and I guess maybe not for others of you, but uh, here it is kind of on the screen. So uh, we have cosine theta plus I sine theta is equal to, uh, to the power of n is equal to cosine um, n of theta is plus I sine n of theta. So essentially what's happening here is that the power is kind of just like going inside the cosine and the sine. And um, we can kind of derive this from the Euler form of the um, complex number. So I guess there are a lot of uh, very interesting kind of 
um, consequences of this that we can discuss and also kind of a lot of ways that we can use this. So let's move on to our first problem just to get a feel for um, how we can possibly apply this. So we have this problem here. Um, use the Morris theorem to express cosine 4 theta as a polynomial in cosine theta. So this is basically just an application of um, Dumas theorem, and oh, I have no space there, so I'll, I guess I'll just do it underneath the. Um, oh, to the right. That's right. <laughs> okay. So I guess um, the first thing that we should think about is Dumas theorem in and of itself. So I'm just kind of oh, it's a bit thick. I'm just going to kind of write that at the top. Oh. Uh, cosine theta plus i sine theta to the power of n. Uh, oh. Uh, uh, change your work. Your work is that I'm just going <laughs> to. Oh, good. I'm just going to leave that there and try again. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> trying again, we've got um, cosine theta plus i sine theta to the n is cosine of um, n theta plus uh, i sine n theta. Um, I guess the first thing that we're going to think of is um, what our n value could possibly be. And I guess it's quite obvious here. It's 4 because we've got cosine of 4 theta. So um, I guess the next thing that we can do is this cosine theta plus i sine theta um, to the fourth power is cosine of 4 theta plus um, i sine of 4 theta. So we're kind of only interested in the cosine bit. So um, I guess it makes sense for us um, for the next step to take the real um, and the imaginary part um, separately. Um, but of course that would entail us expanding the um, left-hand side as per the binomial theorem. Um, and I guess that's kind of just here. That's already done there for you. And essentially what's happened is we've just um, you know expanded from here to here with the binomial theorem, which I will just pencil in. And um, you can notice how we get from, I guess, uh, here, this line, to um, this line. Oh, still not used to the pen. <laughs> to this line, which is just, I guess, a more simplified version. Um, what we've done is essentially we've, we've split it up into the uh, real part and the imaginary part. So this is the imaginary part. And how we've done that is we've simplified um, basically each power of um, i, right? So uh, here, in the first term, we like don't have a power of i, so we don't really need to do anything here. We've got um, i in the second term, i squared in um, the third term, which, as we know, is negative 1, because um, i squared is negative 1, by definition. Um, we've got uh, i to the 3 here, which is just, um, I guess, i squared times i, which is negative i. Um, you know, as you can see, I guess, uh, in the simplified version. We've got i to the 4 here, which is just um, i squared squared, so that's i squared squared, which is negative 1 squared, which is just 1. So that goes in the real part. So after we've kind of made that simplification, after we've kind of made that simplification, what we can do is, um, you know, confidently express things in terms of real and imaginary parts. So um, like I said, we've got our real here and our imaginary here. So um, remember that the whole objective of this question is to obtain um, cosine 4 theta which uh, is kind of up the top there, and that is uh, the real part. So when we equate real parts and real parts, what we'll find is this equation down here. So essentially this is real, and this is also real in our equation, so we can conclude that um, cosine 4 theta can be expressed as this um, identity. However, that's um, not like what they're asking for. They're asking for it as a polynomial in terms of cosine, so we've still got a little bit of work that we need to do. Here, basically what's going on is we've got it in terms of cosine and sine. So um, I guess the objective now is to turn all of those sines into cosines so we can get um, cosine 4 theta purely in terms of the cosines. Luckily for us, we have an identity which kind of serves this exact purpose. We've got sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals to 1, um, which is also, I guess, sine squared theta is 1 minus cosine squared theta. Okay, so that makes our life a lot easier, and I guess, um, you know, for the full simplification, that's just essentially what's happened here. We've replaced, can I change colors? I can. We've essentially replaced all of the um, signs, as you can see here. We've replaced them with one minus cosine um, squared theta as per this formula, yeah? And then after we explain and simplify, uh, we essentially just get this line below, and that is our final answer. So our final answer to part i, is that we can write uh, we can write 
cosine 4 theta as um, 8 cosine to the 4 theta minus 8 cosine squared theta plus 1. So that's very nice and simple. Um, that's our polynomial in terms of cosine. All right, now for the slightly more, I guess, interesting um, application of de Moore, um, Hetz will otherwise find the roots of this polynomial that's kind of down there. Um, so this may seem like, I guess, a little bit unrelated to um, complex numbers or what we've done before. I mean, it's a polynomial, but it's got everything to do with what we've just, I guess, found just then. And um, that is, uh, I guess the clue in that is through the powers of the polynomial of um, cosine theta that we just found over here. So uh, if you can notice, we've got uh, powers of cosine uh, being four, being two, and I guess just like, you know, being zero on the constant term stuff on the end. And um, that kind of looks familiar here, doesn't it? Because in P of X, we've got, um, you know, X to the four, we've got X squared, and we've got a constant term tacked onto the end, which um, kind of uh, is a little bit of a signal to us uh, to do a substitution for X to make it look like something that we've um, familiarized ourselves with already. So I guess the motivation, um, I guess the motivation for the substitution is um, we want x to be, uh, you know, something to do with cosines. And I guess the most logical choice here is the case k cosine theta. And we're going to find what k is later on, don't stress. But um, this is kind of, uh, I guess, what intuition tells us to do. Make a cosine substitution and get something which looks a little bit more like cosine 4 theta on the left-hand side that we can solve more easily than this quartic. So um, essentially what we want to do is we want to get um, this term to look like this term and this term to look like this term. Uh, or at least be some kind of, um, you know, multiple. But I guess it can't really be a multiple because we've got plus one on the end. So um, we want them to be exactly, um, we want 128x to the four to exactly be eight cosine four theta. I'm just gonna write that down. We want 128x to the four to be x. So we let, we, we let this be eight cosine um, theta to the fourth power. Um, and we also have the other equation, which is minus 32x squared equals minus eight cosine squared theta. So after we make this substitution of um, x equals k cosine theta, what we do is we get uh, 128 k to the four cosine to the four theta equals eight cosine to the four theta. We can cancel these. Um, we really only need one equation. We don't really need both of them because it's just one variable that we need to find. Uh, and we get k to the four equals 128. we get eight over 128, which is uh, one on 16. So K is for us um, half. We could also pick negative half, but um, you know, the powers are even. So no one really cares um, what we pick as K. It can be, I guess, plus or minus half, depending on what you prefer. Um, okay, so what happens after here is um, we've made the substitution, we've let, uh, we've let x be uh, half cosine theta, which means our p of x, uh, we can be like rewriting it, I guess, as um, eight cosine to the fourth theta minus eight cosine theta, sorry, cosine squared theta plus one. Uh, hey, and I guess we've found a simpler way to write that in part i, which is just cosine four theta. And solving cosine four theta, I hope you'll agree with me, is a lot easier than solving um, whatever quartic that we've been thrown that has been thrown at us. So that's what we do afterwards, and this is what we get. So this is kind of just solving um, this, and we've made this substitution. So, you know, P of X, solving uh, cosine four theta equals zero is equivalent to solving P of X. So we've got this solution, and you know, you can just obtain that by, I guess, basic trigonometry. And um, I hope you'll agree with me that we have four solutions. So I guess we could um, list out M's forever and ever, but um, we only need four solutions because this is a quartic. So we take four values of N and these four values of N end up being these values. But we're not done yet. We found theta. We haven't found um, X and as we can recall, X is a half cosine theta, which means that it is um, a half cosine pi on eight, uh, half cosine, I guess I'll just write them all out. Three pi on eight, half cosine five pi on eight and half cosine oh, just a line there half cosine seven pi on eight um just as the solutions say here i guess 
which is very nice. So we've found our four solutions to um, the quartic that we've been given using the identity that we've derived, derived from um, DeMarc's theorem. So onto the very last bit. By examining the roots of P of uh, X, find the exact value of sine of eight, uh, pi on 8 and sine of 3 pi on 8. So what's interesting here is that it's been given to us in terms of signs. Uh, well, we're given these like signs, I guess, to find. Um, uh, we've been working with cosines for the whole question, so that's you know a little bit inconvenient for us. But there's luckily a very um, again a very convenient identity for us to turn signs into cosines and vice versa. So we know the identity from I guess just you know right angle triangle you know pick an angle. Uh, we get cosine of um, pi on two minus theta um, is sine theta, and I guess you can agree with me that sine. Uh, pi on 2 minus theta is cosine theta. Okay, so um, in order to make this a little bit easier for us to work with, with the sines, um, I guess what we can do is we can turn them into cosines. So this is also equal to cosine pi on 2 minus pi on 8, cosine um, pi on 2 minus 3 pi on 8. And I hope you can agree with me that this is just equal to cosine 3 pi on 8, cosine pi on 8. Yeah, so actually what we're trying to find is this now. And uh, a piece of very useful information that we've been given is um, the roots of P of X. So um, we've got a product going on here, and I guess the most logical thing to do afterwards is to apply Vieta's formula, which we've hopefully seen in high school before. Um, it's also known as, I guess, product of roots, which is just um, if you take the product of all the roots, let's say we have like alpha, beta, gamma, delta as like the roots of a um, quartic, then it's just like the where we go like, what? I don't have too much time to go into detail, but we go like minus plus, um, minus plus with the coefficients, if you know what I mean. Um, so we get, what is it, 1 on 128 for this case. And yeah, so we get 1 on 128. And conveniently, we know what the roots are for uh, P of X. We found them in part two. So what we can do is we can just take their product as, um, you know, as written here, we can take their product and um, that gives us uh, essentially, oh, sorry, that gives us um, one on 128 as per Vieta's formula or, you know, product of roots, whatever you call it. So uh, we can, I guess, multiply all of these halves over to the other side and we, got, we get something which looks like this. We're still not at our final answer. We've got um, one more trig identity that we kind of need to use. Um, this is the part that we want. This part doesn't exactly look like the part that we want, so we want to make it look like the part that we want. And um, there's another handy identity that we can use, which is this. So this is true because if you look at the inner circle, if you have, let's say, um, a theta value here, uh, I guess pi minus theta is here. So if you've got theta on this side and theta on this side. And um, cosine is the x value, so you know it's like kind of flipped. Hopefully that's a good enough quick explanation of why this is true. But we can go ahead and just apply this and essentially what we'll get is cosine pi on 8, cosine 3 pi on 8. Um, you know, this we can, re we can write this as pi minus 3 pi on 8 and we can write this as pi minus pi on 8. We'll get um, negative cosine 3 pi on 8, you know, as per this identity and negative cosine pi on 8, which gets us 1 on 8. So conveniently, that makes everything in terms of what we want it to be. And I hope you'll agree with me that we can write this. We can conclude that this is true, which means that this is true. But hold on, we've got, I guess, another thing that we need to consider because we've got, uh, I guess, two possible solutions with the plus minus. But um, there's quite an easy fix for this, which is just if we consider the cosine curve, got y and we've got x. We've got something that looks like this. Ooh, no. Oh, no. Okay. We've got something that looks like this. We've got pi on 2 here and we've got um, pi here. So uh, anything that any value um, of x or anything that goes inside the cosine which is smaller than pi on 2, um, I hope you can agree is positive. And uh, pi on 8 and 3 pi on uh, 8 are both acute which means that we can conclude that this thing is positive. So we can ultimately conclude that psi, uh, uh, that, yeah, 
that sine of pi on 8, sine of 3 pi on 8, which is equal to cosine of pi on 8, cosine of 3 pi on 8, is 1 on 2 root 2. And that's our final answer. Okay, um, does anyone have any questions so far? Yes? Will we use Maple to simplify this whole equation? Uh, probably, because I don't think we're going to have much time to find this thing. Well, you can. But do we generally use Maple for such a way? I don't know, that's your choice. It's essentially as long as you can like find the Maple function to use, uh, which might also be useful since we're holding a Maple workshop tomorrow, but I guess that's a question for there. Sound good? Can I, can I move on? Any other questions? No other questions? Okay. I'll move on. Um, let's do roots of unity. So, essentially, um, this question is asking us to find a set of non-real solutions to this equation. And uh, the first thing I like to do when solving any equation is think about how many solutions there are just to make sure that we're not missing out on anything, I guess. So, um, how we do that is we um, kind of apply fundamental theorem of algebra a little bit, and then we also, I guess, look at the thing that we've been given. So uh, I guess the leading term on the right hand, on the left hand side, would be uh, would be omega to the seventh, and on the right hand side it would be um, negative omega to the seventh because you know it's a, a odd power of negative omega. And I hope you can agree with me. We can move this to the other side, and if we move everything to one side, the thing that was the thing that we're solving is this one plus omega to the seven plus oh sorry minus minus 1 minus omega to the 7th is 0. And um, the leading term is 2 omega to the 7th, as I've just explained, which means that we've got 7 solutions. So by the fundamental theorem of algebra, we've got 7 solutions to this. Okay? So um, we know that if we get anything less than 7, we're missing something. Um, unless there's like a repeated root, uh, which we will find out. Uh, there is not. So to make this look like a more familiar, I guess, uh, roots of unity question, I guess the first thing that we can do is um, divide over. So roots of unity is usually like something to the power of something equals one, or you know some other value on the right hand side. But usually there's like a power and a singular entity to that power. So to do that, I'm going to divide over um, what's on the right hand side to the left, and where we get this. So like I said, roots of unity questions, um, you know, a more typical roots of unity question would look a bit more like this, or a bit more basic would look like this. So um, I hope you can agree with me that this would be, I guess, a wise thing to do. So we um, define something uh, called z, which we let equal whatever's inside the brackets. So we can now solve for z. So solve for z. And we get uh, z to the seventh equals one. We can also write one as um, e to the zero plus two pi k i. Um, and the reason we can do that is because, you know, like the um, angle, we can just like go again and again and again, I guess. So I hope you can agree with me that no matter how many, um, uh, no matter how many um, integer multiples of 2 pi we add on to the power, um, it'll still stay as 1. And this is important because we've got multiple solutions. Um, we can apply to Moore's theorem, uh, I guess, take both sides to the 1 on 7th power, uh, 2 pi k on 7 i, and this is what we get. So we've got seven solutions to this, so we can take um, seven values of k, and I guess it would make most sense to take the values 0, 1, uh, all the way up to 6. So what this means is that our z values are e to the 0, e to the 2 pi on 7 i, e to the 4 pi on 7 i, all the way up to e to the um, 12 pi on 7 i. Um, so we're not done yet, even though we've solved sort of the equation, because what we want isn't z, what we want is omega. So um, basically what that means is we take this and we uh, find, I guess, omega in terms of z. So let's do that now. Okay, z, 1 minus omega is equal to 1 plus omega. Um, we want omega, so z minus z omega is 1 plus omega, and then omega, oh, uh, omega 1 plus z is equal to, we move that one to that side, the other one to the other side. Hopefully that's correct. Um, which gives us omega is equal to z minus 1 
over z plus one. Okay, so that's convenient. Um, I guess because all our omegas are in terms of like, um, or can be written as e to the i theta, let's use, I guess, theta as kind of our like general placeholder angle for the moment while we figure out a slightly more elegant way to write um, omega, which isn't just this. So we've got omega equals to e to the i theta minus one, e to the i theta plus one, and um, essentially what we want to do is just to get a bit of a nicer looking um, omega, we multiply by this. Um, there's also, I guess, an alternative um, way to clean this up, which I personally prefer, which is writing it as this, minus one, um, um, e to the i theta plus one, and multiplying the top and bottom by minus um, i theta to the two. This is, I guess, a personal favorite of mine. Um, so we get e to the i theta on two, minus e to the minus i theta on 2 over e to the i theta on 2 plus e to the minus i theta on 2. And um, I hope you can agree with me, this is, this is, hold on, 2 i sine theta on 2 cosine theta on 2, which is, uh, oh, sorry, 2, which is i tan theta on 2. If you do um, T formula, half angle, whatever you want to call it, you'll find out that these are the same thing. So um, I guess they're two alternative versions of cleaning up the same expression. Just kind of depends on which one you like more. I like the second one more, but that's my personal preference. Let me just delete this. Oh, I'm just going to delete that. Okay, so we're at our answer, essentially. Um, we're basically at our answer. And uh, like I said before, we've got seven solutions. Um, you know, it is very, uh, I guess, cohesive with what we've discussed in the beginning. There are seven solutions and we have found seven solutions. So we're done, essentially. Um, and our set of solutions is this. So um, this is our set of solutions for omega. It's I sine um, with this angle where this angle is just um, multiples of, I guess, two n pi on seven. And there's another thing which is kind of important. We want the set of non-real solutions. So um, we don't actually care about the real solutions. And there is one real solution which we obtain. So if we look here, um, the angles that we have are 0, 2 pi on 7, uh, all the way up to 12 pi on 7. If we sub in 0, uh, what do we get? We get 0, I guess. So we don't really care about 0. Um, so non-real means just things that aren't real. 0 is real. 0 is also purely imaginary, but that's a different question. Um, so non-real means no zeros, which just means uh, this. And our theta values or our n values are these values. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, and that's it for today, I think. Do we have any other questions? I think we finished very early. <laughs> yeah, it's just about on time. Oh, really? Um, yeah, so we can put off the stream for now. OK. But if anyone has other questions they want us to have a crack at, all final names, but yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. How do I end the stream?